What's going on YouTube? Jay's Two Cents here. And as a reviewer, I've got the responsibility of making sure that I get it right. There's a lot of people looking at this channel and watching these videos for opinions to help make proper decisions when it comes to spending their money on various PC components and hardware. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did a video on the Sapphire 290X Tri-X 8GB AMD graphics card and a lot of you felt that I did a very terrible job at giving that card a thorough review. And you know what? The more I thought about it, the more I thought you guys were right, which is why we're going to do the responsible thing and go back and do a take two of the Sapphire Tri-X 8GB 290X. I mean, after all, this card really does deserve it. The Fractal Design R5 is so amazing, it fits all kinds of cool hardware in there. Water cooling, air cooling, and on top of that, it's silent. And it's awesome. Like explosions. Or like, like quiet explosions. Now cards like this kind of make it a little bit difficult on the consumer to try and figure out whether or not they need a card with 8 gigabytes. And that really is the star of today's show. Now, I do want to apologize for getting the previous video a bit rushed and a bit just lackluster because I think I was a bit excited and pressed for time to get Skunk Works uh, completed, as well as the Parvin build, which you guys have recently seen go up. So now we are circling back and giving this card the thorough investigation that it really deserves. Now, Sapphire is one of two brands that actually offer an 8 gigabyte variant of the 290 and 290X. Now, you might be asking yourself, why does the 8 gigabytes exist? Now, I've already kind of said it, the 8 gigabytes really is the star of the show when it comes to this graphics card. I mean, the Hawaii-based GPU is nothing new. It's actually been out since October of 2013, and it's really starting to become dated when it comes to refresh cycles of GPUs. We all know the 300 series is literally right around the corner, and that tends to be the time when Prices are constantly fluctuating and dropping. Even this card right here is continuing to drop in price over time. And when the new cards drop, people are gonna find themselves wondering, well, do I need a 300 series card or can I get away with going something like the 290X or 298 gigabyte versions? And we won't spend a lot of time going over the specs concerning not, nothing has really changed, especially since two weeks ago and certainly nothing's changed on this card because I've had it the entire time. It is based on the Hawaii GPU uh, it does have a turbo clock of 1,020 megahertz. I was able to overclock it to 1,125, uh, higher than any other 290 or 290X so far that I've taken a look at on this channel. I was able to overclock the RAM to 1,425 megahertz. Remember that number is times four when it comes to AMD GPUs. And it does have eight gigabytes of GDDR5 running at 512-bit memory bus. So. The specs on this thing are really impressive, but how does it perform when it comes to games? Uh, well, gaming is not the entire story when it comes to this card. In fact, I'm kind of glad I got a chance to really take a look at this card again and look at it from a different perspective. If you guys remember, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Leap Computing's cloud-based gaming and how there's two options at launch that you can go with. One is a Titan X, and the other is a 298 gigabyte. Now, when you talk about a client-based system that's sitting right here in front of you, you would think, okay, well, Titan X is probably going to be the fastest GPU, so why wouldn't you want it? And I kind of said that same thing to Leap. I said, why would anyone go with older architecture rather than cutting edge when the price is the same? And Leap basically said, well, the reality and the fact remains that AMD's computational power on the GPU is far superior to Nvidia's. And I kind of thought, you know, I think that might be true, considering the Fire Pros have always been uh, so powerful and definitely uh, for productive needs, very cost to performance ratio. And they said that if you are doing a lot of rendering or a lot of uh, GPU based computational workflows, then you're definitely going to want to go with AMD where it's going to give you a better stream quality. So that got me thinking. Lots of GPU VRAM. Lots of people aspiring to either be famous YouTubers or famous Twitch streamers, which means rendering videos or live rendering gameplay up to a server and streaming it, you're going to be offloading a lot of GPU power, a lot of computational power onto the GPU. So the eight gigabyte buffer really does come in handy. It's not just about high resolutions, but it's also about high 
performance for the GPU when tasks are offloaded onto the GPU. And with modern APIs like Mantle and DX12 coming in the future, this is a bit of future proofing. Yeah, I know you guys know I don't like the word future proofing, but there is a bit of future proofing involved with higher uh, frame buffers when it comes to GPUs. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the benchmark numbers here. I did a couple of games. Uh, we did some Far Cry 4, um, GTA 5, Battlefield 4, not Hardline. I don't even have Hardline installed on the test bench yet. And then uh, some Metro Last Light. So let's go ahead and look at those benchmarks. And then we're going to do a live demo actually of Premiere with one of my workflows. We're going to show you where this card really shines. Transition. I'm not using a capture card on this because the screen tear is really bad when I use a capture card, so you're just gonna have to deal with it. But you can see right here, this section that's going up and down is the core clock, and this section up here on the very top is the GPU usage. So as I scrub, you can see the GPU starts to immediately do something. Now the other thing I wanna point out here is that there is absolutely no lag in the scrubbing or the playback. And that's because we're offloading all of the playback Instead of to the CPU RAM, we're offloading everything to the GPU. So the GPU is taking over the workload here for the entire playback. Now, no matter where we play it, it's instant seeking. I mean, have you guys ever tried to do any sort of editing and the moment you start skipping around the timeline, it takes a second to load or the playback here is in half uh, resolution. We're in full resolution right here. So, you guys can see that it just does an amazing job at keeping things very, very responsive. Now, the more layers and things that you add, the more that you'll start offloading into some of that GPU RAM. We're only using 630 megabytes right now of GPU. But if we start, let's just start adding some things to this and see what happens here. So let's add, whoops. So let's add a, a YouTube logo. Let's add some vignetting. We're just making layers here. I know it looks like crap, but we're just making layers here. Let's add a troll face. Ha ha ha, Twitter bird. Another transparent overlay. Uh, let's do a that's what she said bubble. Jerry's bobblehead that I made him, my bobblehead. Whoa, that's huge. Uh, let's see, do some more transparencies. Mm. Okay, let's do this. Let's do the circuit background, but let's bring back down the opacity on that one. So we'll have some transparency on there. And let's go ahead and cut this clip like that. And let's add some sharpness, because you know sharpening is very intensive. And let's just crank the sharpness amount all the way to the top. And look at that. Do you see the way it continues to scrub anyway? The fans are gonna go for the lower rad. And I think I'm gonna take the lower radiators. Look at that. I think I'm gonna take the lower radiators off of the smart. So you can see it didn't matter. It just did not care. The lower radiators. You can see on the way the Now this is all 1080p footage. It would be, you know, if it was a 4K video workflow, it would be probably more into the GPU RAM. But we're just basic Premiere like this, you can see it's doing a fantastic job at just giving us some decent workflow. But for those of you who are using things like, uh, you know, 3D Studio Max or After Effects or just doing any sort of high-end motion graphics, then that eight gigabyte buffer is definitely gonna be something you're interested in. But I just wanted to give a quick demo here of how things looked in Premiere and, uh, and how playback and everything is just completely instant and let you actually see how it is offloading onto the GPU right here. You can see the GPU usage going up, and I think it goes up when we start playing all of these portions right so here. Let's see. The, the fans are going to go for the lower red. And I think I'm going to take the lower eh, not too much. Very dusty. I think I'm going to take the lower All right. 
Well, there you go, there's that little demo. Now, before getting out of here, it's worth noting that the eight gigabyte buffer is not only beneficial to productivity workflows. You guys know that there's been definitely a push towards more and more VRAM and graphics cards and being utilized by games where developers are really starting to tap into massive amounts of VRAM in terms of texture packs, PC mods, and things like that. Uh, Shadow of Mordor requires six gigabytes of VRAM if you're gonna be running the high resolution texture pack. And we all know that I've been berated for saying that sky mod modding is only you know, beneficial to a small amount of people. Apparently an awful lot of you do Skyrim modding, which really can eat up into the VRAM as well. And then of course, Minecraft. Even though this GPU die is nearly two years old, it still remains very relevant, even in the 1440p. Uh, resolution 4k one of these cards even with 8 gigabyte vram is or buffer is not going to be enough for 4k as you can see by the fps on the charts but 1440p is still massively playable even at highest presets on all of these graphics settings and it's going to remain more relevant into the future as resolution uh, gets more you know vram intensive you're going to have a card that's going to last a lot longer in fact four gigabyte cards are going to start seeing their age a lot sooner than slower gpu cards with more uh, gigabytes of VRAM. So this is going to remain relevant well into the future here, at least for the next several years. So it's definitely a card worth consider picking up if you're looking at stepping up above 1080p resolutions, or you just want to have a longer lasting card, even at 1080p resolutions, ultra settings, and getting into some PC modding or PC gaming modding, and still have uh, enough power to do workflow with a single card, live streaming, editing, and all of that stuff. So really, the card is a jack of all trades. So guys, there you go. I wanted to circle back and take a look at this card once again. This Sapphire didn't ask me to do this. I did this entirely on my own. In fact, I asked Sapphire if I could borrow the card for longer uh, so that I could do this video. I have tied up and utilized this card for well more than my, than my welcome. I've overstayed my welcome with this card, so it's time to send it back but I at least wanted to make the previous shitty video that I did right by doing more uh, traditional tests that it definitely deserved. So if you guys were considering buying a graphics card and you weren't sure if the new 300 series was gonna make these things obsolete, absolutely not. They're gonna last well into the future. Plenty of GPU power, lots of VRAM, huge memory bandwidth and it's still relevant and is gonna be relevant for quite a while. Now, of course, pricing on these cards is always fluctuating, so I don't really talk about pricing in the videos unless it really warrants it, uh, especially with graphics cards. They're always going up and down, especially as new things are released. So if you wanna see the current pricing, just look in the description to find a link down there where you can see what the current Amazon pricing is anyway, uh, as well as other links to Amazon affiliate codes if you guys wanna support the channel. If not, go ahead and support your favorite YouTuber. We all uh, are a community, so we're supporting one of us or all of us is always welcomed. Now, as always, guys, uh, couldn't do these videos without you, so every single time, I'm always gonna say it, Thanks for watching.